Though not the first JRPG to ever exist, Dragon Quest beat it to the punch by about a year, Final Fantasy is a foundational game that helped popularize the genre, and its influence and legacy cannot be understated. And yet, in the 35 years since its original release in 1987, there has never been a truly definitive version. Each port, remaster, or remake is flawed in some way, and only one or two are even worth playing today. The original North American NES version from 1990s Plagued with Bugs features a shoddy translation and is overly difficult. The PlayStation Remaster from 2003 considerably updates the game's audiovisual presentation, including the addition of cutscenes, and features several quality of life improvements, but still suffers from the original's excessive need for grinding, as well as adding in disc based loading times. 2004 gave us a pared down port of the PSX version on the Game Boy Advance, complete with worse graphics and sound, and a corrected difficulty so low it's insulting. And while it tries to make up for that with four brand new optional bonus dungeons, they feel like more of an afterthought than anything else, especially considering how you have to run each dungeon multiple times if you want to fight all the bosses. Then came 2007's 20th Anniversary Edition on the PlayStation Portable. A full remake of the GBA port, it's drop-dead gorgeous and restores nearly every feature from the PSX version and even includes a fifth bonus dungeon, but sadly still suffers from the GBA's reduced difficulty while adding back in the PlayStation's longer load times. Thankfully, in 2021, the PSP version was superseded by the Pixel Remaster on PC and mobile, but not console for some reason, at least as of this recording. Unfortunately, the Pixel Remaster isn't as pretty as the 20th Anniversary Remake, though including a full reorchestration of the game's score overseen by the original composer more than makes up for it. And yet, the lack of inclusion regarding the bonus dungeons from the GBA and PSP feels like a missed opportunity to make this version truly definitive, even as lackluster as those editions were. I don't know what Square was thinking when they chose the default English font. It's far too narrow and difficult to read, even for me, and while it's an easy enough fix on PC, mobile players have no choice but to deal with it. Of the six playable classes on offer, the Thief is the only useless one. The Warrior and Monk serve as good damage dealers and tanks, the Black and White Mages are your offensive and support casters respectively, and the Red Mage is a jack-of-all-trades able to wield both schools of magic while still using weapons effectively. The Thief, on the other hand, can't even steal, making the name oxymoronic, and his only advantage lies in a higher success rate when fleeing combat. As a result, I always switch him out for a Red Mage to better balance my party. Say hello to Candle, Jack, Jill, and Carl, my Warriors of Light. Speaking of which, however, the Light Warriors are the least defined characters in the game, never given an ounce of personality beyond the names you give them. They are blank slates in the truest sense and never speak, even when it could be beneficial to advance the plot. The winds die and the seas rage are inherently contradictory. Wind, more than ocean currents, is what creates waves, and storm winds in particular are what cause raging seas. If the wind truly has died, the surface of the ocean should be as flat and smooth as a mirror. That said, it is nice to see the location of each crystal shrine appear when that particular element is referenced. But on the other hand, this opening scene does little more than set the stage and offers the player little insight on where to go or what to do, as becomes immediately apparent when the game properly starts and the player is simply dumped into the overworld with zero fanfare. It's in the nearby town of Cornelia we get the first inklings of a quest, and despite knowing full well the Warriors of Light have a more important task, Cornelia's king asks them instead to rescue his daughter who's been kidnapped by an errant knight. For being a shut-in, the Queen doesn't seem at all surprised to have four complete strangers barge into her chamber. Like many RPGs of its day, Final Fantasy relies almost solely on random encounters on the overworld and in dungeons to drive its combat, and it's hard to understate the influence this game had with its battle mechanics and presentation. That said, the inclusion of redirected attacks, while an amazing quality of life improvement, means what was originally a back-and-forth strategic affair for most fights has been reduced to simply mashing A to win, and the further inclusion of an auto-battle feature just makes the combat even more mindless. And now is as good a time as any to explain the magic system, too. It's lifted wholesale from the pages of a D&D player's manual complete with spell levels and separate casting charges for each level, though not each spell, that can only be refilled with the dawn of a new day. Which is a bit of a problem since Final Fantasy doesn't have a day-night cycle, meaning your only option is to sleep at an inn or use a tent or cottage in the field, or use the ethers that were included from the GBA version onward to make the game easier. Otherwise, magic quickly becomes useless in most fights since you'll want to save it for the bosses. As far as first dungeons go, the Temple of Chaos is incredibly simple. There are a couple rooms with loot off to the sides, half of which are currently inaccessible, but the boss is a straight shot north. 
Despite being an unparalleled swordsman, Garland is a total pushover, particularly if you've spent any time fighting monsters to get to him. No forced backtracking is always a win. It's only after rescuing the princess that the king informs the Light Warriors of their true quest. Princess Sarah gives the Light Warriors a precious family heirloom for rescuing her, believing it may come in handy. The loot is required to access the game's final dungeon, and is entirely missable for novice players. It makes zero sense that the king would wait until after the Light Warriors rescued his daughter to rebuild this bridge. It's the only land connection his kingdom has with the larger world, possibly even the only connection, given that the raging seas and dying winds must be making the southern port unusable. My god, this scene gets more beautiful with every remake, and it perfectly bookends the game's prologue. And yet, this text scrolls far too slowly. I'm done reading each line well before the next one even appears. Visiting Matoya before defeating Astos is entirely optional, but doing so gives some added context and helps flesh out the world. Matoya's brooms teach you how to open the world map, though the button combo they give you is all but useless since the new minimap system is never more than a single button press away, even for the world map. Despite their overwhelming numbers, BK's crew is no match for the Light Warriors. It really makes me wonder why the people of Provoka never tried to toss them out of town themselves. Considering its sprite is drawn with full rigging, this ship should not be able to sail given what we know of Final Fantasy's world. Remember, there's no wind to fill the sails to say nothing of the supposedly raging seas. Come to think of it, who exactly is crewing the ship anyway? There's no reason to think the Light Warriors know how to sail, and even if they did, there's only four of them while BK's crew numbered at least nine. Not to mention that the Light Warriors clearly have their hands full with the monsters that appear on deck. Lally ho! Like with Matoya visiting Mount Durgar, this early is optional, but the dwarves are a good source of information. But Final Fantasy does fall prey to the Scottish dwarves cliché, and seeing the accent written like this makes my head hurt trying to read it. The dwarven blacksmith is named... Smith. The lone elven town is creatively named Elfheim, but hey, at least that's better than the original translation of Elf Land. The Elven Prince's Coma is the clinch point of a fetch quest that dominates the first quarter of Final Fantasy's runtime and sees you backtracking through already explored areas more often than not. He can only be awakened with Matoya's Jolt Tonic, but she only gives it to you after returning her Crystal Eye, which you can only get by defeating Astos, who you can't fight until you've retrieved the crown. And all of this is required because the Elven Prince holds the Mystic Key, which you need to get the Nitro Powder in Cornelia Castle for Narek the Dwarf, so he can blow open a canal allowing your ship out into the wider world. And throughout all this, not a single person mentions the crystals or where they are. That said, it is nice that the Mystic Key opens more than just the one door, unlocking access to good early game loot, so long as you don't mind even more backtracking to the Western Keep, the Marsh Cave, and the Chaos Shrine. Visiting the Western Keep before the Marsh Cave really shouldn't be optional since doing so gives some much needed context. Otherwise, novice players could find the crown first before wandering aimlessly trying to find a use for it. Speaking of the Marsh Cave, with its branching paths, generous loot, and stronger monsters, it makes a far better first dungeon than the Chaos Shrine. And the new map features really help when navigating Final Fantasy's labyrinthine dungeons too, meaning I no longer feel the need to play this game with a guide open. The Pixel Remaster also replaces the old duplicate chest and encounter point mechanics with trapped chests and these robed figures, meaning you don't have to watch your step anymore. Revealing that the king in the Western Keep is really Astos neatly foreshadows that events aren't always as straightforward as they seem. Also, Matoya is a dick to the player after you return her stolen eye. This scene was far more epic in the PlayStation and PSP versions. Melmond was recently attacked by a vampire, so of course their sanctuary was destroyed. Speaking of which, the vampire serves as a wonderful fake-out with regards to the great evil corrupting the Earth Crystal. That said, you will be forced to backtrack out of the dungeon after beating him because you need the Earthrod to progress any deeper. And if you try to get that first, you'll find your way blocked by the Titan, who will only let you pass in exchange for the Star Ruby, which is found directly after defeating the Vampire. The Lich, the first of the Elemental Fiends, is a master of the undead and is appropriately weak to fire and holy magic. And look at that sprite work! Yoshitaka Amano really is a talented artist, and Square did a wonderful job bringing his designs to life. Just the sheer size of the Lich in comparison to ordinary monsters really shows how important he is. Still, it takes nearly a quarter of the game to reach the first crystal, with the plot thus far having little if anything to do with the actual main quest you're on. 
Not to mention the fact that the crystals in the menu, while they do light up as you restore them, are in completely the wrong order. Like many 8 and 16-bit JRPGs, Final Fantasy's overworld wraps both horizontally and vertically, which makes navigation a cinch, but calls into question the physics of this world since a spherical planet is then impossible. The town of Crescent Lake is appropriately named. It's only after reaching the Circle of Sages that the player is given some much-needed exposition. According to the Sages, the Wind Fiend appeared 400 years ago and the Water Fiend 200. Assuming that corruption of a crystal coincides with the arrival of a fiend, something that seems likely given the recent events at Melmond, the wind stopped and the seas started raging centuries ago. With the ensuing breakdown of the water cycle, life on this world anywhere other than near the Earth crystal should have long since ended. And here we have yet another contradiction. If the wind and water fiends appeared, why is it different when it comes to fire who has apparently awoken 200 years ahead of schedule? Upon receiving the canoe, you can finally sequence break the game, restoring the three remaining crystals in any order you want. Lava, or magma rather, considering we're underground, only hurts you when you move. Merilith speaks in the third person. The Fire Fiend, despite living in a volcano where most monsters are weak to ice magic, is not herself weak to ice magic. But yeah, I'd, I'd hit that. After restoring the Fire Crystal, you'd be forgiven for not knowing what to do next. While you could stumble across the ice cavern on your own or by talking to an NPC from the nearby town, you need the airship to continue exploring after that, and the only NPCs that point you to the unmarked bit of desert where it hides are all the way back in Elfheim, which is a bit out of the way if you ask me. But speaking of the Ice Cavern, it has a secondary exit which is the only way out after a certain point, and it's very easy to leave without getting the Levastone, meaning you'd have to run the whole dungeon again. Oh, and because the Levastone is surrounded by cracks that all lead to the same room, you have to run half the dungeon again anyway. But once you have it, you can finally go raise the airship. It's just a shame the scene was drastically toned down from the PSP version. Despite initially taking off from the desert, the airship can't land on desert tiles. In fact, it can only land on plains tiles, and most key locations going forward are still a decent walk away from the nearest landing sites. Bahamut, a regular staple of the franchise, makes his first appearance and tasks the Light Warriors with proving their courage at the Citadel of Trials, kicking off what is probably Final Fantasy's only substantial side quest. Because the ship can dock at river mouths once you have the canoe, it's possible to enter the Citadel of Trials before getting the airship, though I never do. Astos' crown is finally given another use. The prize at the end of the Citadel of Trials, the proof of your courage, turns out to be none other than a rat's tail. But by delivering the tail to Bahamut, he rewards your party by upgrading their classes. Not only are the new classes more powerful than the old ones, but the wizards all have expanded spellbooks and the knight and ninja can now use low-level white and black magic respectively, meaning the thief is no longer useless. But then we're right back in fetch quest territory because you need the Oxyale to enter the Sunken Shrine, which is received for freeing the fairy who lives in Gaia and is being sold for quite a bit by the caravan in an unmarked bit of desert. Like the Earth Cave, the Sunken Shrine is a two-part dungeon, though this time you start in the middle. The Water Crystal lies at the bottom, but the Rosetta Stone, a key item needed to access the next dungeon, lies at the top. Sure, the Kraken is no Ultras, but who says Final Fantasy's obsession with octopus villains began with the sixth game? Oh, and the Water Fiend is indeed weak to electricity. Dr. Oon uses the Rosetta Stone to teach the Light Warriors how to speak Lufinian in mere moments, never mind that learning to read an ancient language is completely different from learning to speak one, or how time affects the evolution of languages to begin with. While he doesn't appear in the game, Sid is at least referenced as the creator of the airship. And yes, I'm aware this was retconned in for the remakes and remasters. The existence of robots in Final Fantasy's world proves that science fiction has always been a part of the franchise. The Mirage Tower may be a short dungeon, but it leads directly into the next, so come prepared. Getting to the Wind Crystal requires two keys, the Warp Cube from the Waterfall Cave to transport from the Mirage Tower to the Flying Fortress, and the Chime from Lufinia to access the Mirage Tower in the first place. Calling this an observation window can only be correct if Final Fantasy's world is flat and the Flying Fortress hovers high above the Chaos Shrine both of which are actually impossible. Thanks to the way the overworld wraps, we've already established that the world is a donut, and the energy from the Wind Crystal comes from the location of the Mirage Tower, which then makes it safe to assume the Flying Fortress, the actual home of the Wind Crystal, is directly overhead. But hey, X marks the spot! Warmech is a precursor to the optional super bosses the franchise would eventually become known for, and Warmech is no joke, it's an even tougher challenge than the final boss himself. 
Tiamat, the Wind Fiend, uses fire, ice, and electric attacks. With all four fiends defeated and the crystals restored, there's only one thing left to do. Take our newly found adamantite to Smith the Smith so he can forge Excalibur for us, arguably the most powerful weapon in the game. And then revisit the Circle of Sages so we can finally figure out just what the hell is really going on. According to them, we're stuck in a time loop that spans the last 2,000 years, yet only started a scant few days ago. And the only way to break it is to travel back in time. This isn't quite true, but I'll talk more about that when we get there. For now though, it's time to tackle the game's final dungeon, the Chaos Shrine. How cool is it that the game ends right back where it began? It's almost like a circle or a loop or something. Oh, wait a second. The Lufinians talked about sending five warriors of their own to combat the fiends 400 years ago, and wouldn't you know it, the five bats in the Chaos Shrine are those warriors. While it's never explicitly stated, the so-called Black Crystal is just as important as the other four. It is, after all, the crystal that governs time itself. By stepping back in time 2,000 years, we get a chance to see what the Chaos Shrine looked like in its heyday. Sarah's loot finally gets used. You are forced to fight each of the elemental fiends again in turn, and while yes, this is technically just a boss rush segment, it's still nice that the fiends are stronger than when you last fought them, even lacking the elemental weaknesses they would eventually pick up in the future. The Masamune is the strongest weapon in the game with higher stats than even Excalibur, but it's only available just before the game is done. Fighting all the way to the Chaos Shrine's lowest level reveals the great evil behind everything that's happened, and it's none other than… Garland? Yes, remember him? All the way from the beginning of the game? Turns out he was the big bad all along. So let me get this straight. The Fiend saved Garland's life by pulling him back through time so he could become the embodiment of Chaos and send them forward through time just so they could send him back again? Do I have that right? If so, that would indeed create a time loop allowing Chaos to rule forever. There's just one problem though. Garland claims to have already sent the Fiends into the future, but we had to fight them just to reach him. So if his plans hinge on sending the Fiends forward, then how exactly can that happen if we've already defeated them here in the past? Garland's plan was doomed to fail is what I'm saying. What's really frustrating though is that defeating the Fiends in the past doesn't even break the loop, despite what the developers try to tell us in the ending text crawl. All that does is allow the Fiends to slink off to their respective shrines, slowly draining the crystals over the remaining centuries until they're powerful enough to again exert their influences on the world and eventually save Garland by sending him to the past. And that's if Garland wasn't lying about having already sent them into the future in the first place. All of this to say, Final Fantasy's ending is broken, not the time loop. Ironic then that a busted time travel plot would come out of the same studio that would go on to create one of the best time travel narratives in gaming history less than a decade later. But hey, we're not sending Chrono Trigger today. Chaos's design is metal as hell, and truth be told, with as many times as I've played this game now, this is the only boss to offer a real challenge. So now we come to the end of the game, and I'm left with a few final thoughts. The last time I made a video like this, I concluded that no single version was the best way to play. That's no longer the case. The NES and PSX versions are in my mind too difficult, and the GBA and PSP too easy. But the Pixel Remaster? Well, it has its moments, the early game especially proves a good challenge, and Chaos himself is a tough fight even with a well-balanced party. But I never once felt the need to grind, aside from getting the extra gill to pad out my spellbooks, which is a good thing since they nixed the infamous Peninsula of Power. But beyond that, most of my gripes go all the way back to the original release of the game, the lackluster storytelling, the generic plot, and broken ending in particular. The battle mechanics, while basic, are at least serviceable considering that as one of the first JRPGs, Final Fantasy was mostly making it up as it went. And the franchise would continue to iterate and build off of what started here for years to come. Oh, and let's not forget how well designed the overworld was. I mean, yeah, it gets zero points for geographical realism, the edge wrapping notwithstanding, but I'm talking more about how it shepherded the player through the story, slowly opening up as you progress in an era when most games were about simply moving from left to right and stories were largely relegated to a paragraph in the manual, if that. And while yes, there are some aspects of story and world progression I think could have been handled better, I'm looking at you, airship in an unmarked desert, I still think it largely gets things right. So whether you're new to Final Fantasy or a longtime fan, I'd still recommend giving it a go in 2022 and beyond. And the Pixel Remaster is indeed, to my mind, the absolute best way to play. Here's to hoping we'll eventually get that rumored console release so even more people can enjoy the game that began it all.